faithfulness on our behalf and bless us this morning as we read about your son. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, I don't often get political here, but let me tell you guys right now who I don't want you to vote for president for. Don't vote for me. So I do really low bar humor, but I was thinking this week about the fact that, you know, this upcoming election will likely have uh, two men ages 77 and 81 running for president. And like who in an ideal situation, who do I want to be president? I want someone who is going to be competent at the job and who has an outstanding moral character. All right, I want someone who knows foreign policy, who knows how to get along and make things happen and wants to like, bless this country, and I want someone who's not going to use their power for themselves and will not be corrupt and will do things with, with justice. Like That's my ideal for the presidency. And where in the world is there in the world a candidate like that? We'll see come November whether or not God, God gives us one like that. Either way, that question is I'm not the first one to ask. Uh, when I was in high school, my father and I were in a musical called Camelot, if you guys remember, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And in this story, you have Lancelot. He's from France, and he hears the legends of what's happening in Camelot and this idyllic kingdom. He wants to be part of it. And so in the musical Camelot, Lancelot begins to sing a song about both the qualifications physically and then the moral qualifications that a knight of the round table should have. And so, forgive me, I'm reading verse here. I'm not going to sing it. Uh, it says, the knight of the table round should be invincible and succeed where a less fantastic man would fail and climb a wall that no one else can climb, cleave a dragon in record time, swim a moat in a coat of heavy iron mail. No matter the pain, he ought to be unwincible and impossible deeds should be his daily fare. But where in the world is there in a world a man so extraordinaire? And if you've seen the musical, you know at this point Lancelot says, c'est moi, which is French for, it's me. And he goes on to boast about his heroic feats and the fact that he's never been defeated in battle before. And then he starts to talk about the moral characters of the knight of a round table. He says, the soul of a knight should be a thing remarkable. Oh, his heart and his mind is pure as morning dew. With a will and a self-restraint, that's the envy of every saint. He could easily work a miracle or two. To love and desire, he ought to be unsparkable. And the ways of the flesh should offer no allure. But where in the world is there in the world a man so untouched and pure? C'est moi. I blush to disclose, I'm far too noble to lie. That man in whom these qualities bloom, c'est moi, c'est moi, tis I. I've never strayed from all I believe. I'm blessed with an iron will. Had I been made the partner of Eve, we'd be in Eden still. <laughs> and if you saw the musical, you know that the, the tragic irony of the song is that Lance Lana is not the man he thinks he is. Because by the time he shows up in Camelot, he falls in love with King Arthur's wife, Guinevere. And they have an illicit affair. And this forbidden love crushes a kingdom and the dream dies. But the question remains, where in a world is there in a world a man like that? When you come to the scriptures, we find a story of God longing for a human through whom he can work to bless the world. And his first human partners, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve in the garden, guess what? They failed. And then you just go through the story and Noah and Abram and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the Israelites and the judges and Samuel and Saul and King David and just throughout the end and, and they fail. And God has committed himself to working through human partners, but the question is, where in the world is there in the world a man who will actually trust and believe God in his word long enough for God to bring about his redemptive purposes in the world? And is it all hopeless? But my friends, I have good news this morning, and his name is Jesus. And this morning, we're going to read about the temptation of Jesus or the testing of Jesus, depending on your Bible translation. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. Hey, Kevin, for those who are online, would you be willing to put the camera on for them so they have something to, to watch? But yeah, we read in Matthew chapter 4, um, some of your Bibles might have a, a title of the various sections. So some might say Jesus is tested in the wilderness, and some might say Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. 
And the reason we have those two variations is because in Greek, it's a single word, the, the test. And, and even in English, we understand that sometimes people put us to the test for our good, and sometimes people put us to the test for evil. So it's all about the intent. So a school teacher might test the students. Do you know your subject matter? A uh, music teacher will say, let's do a recital. Have you mastered the material? A coach will say, it's game day. It's a test. Ha have you guys trained and disciplined enough to execute a game plan and to have victory over your opponents? But then, negatively, you might have, we'll say, a uh, political correspondent, a news reporter, grilling a politician with hard questions, hoping to make them look like a fool. It's a test. And they're hoping that they'll fail. Sometimes there's people out there who try to trick you by slipping you super shady uh, legal contracts that if you aren't careful, you're going to sign things away that you never intended to sign away. It's a test. Will we pass? And this morning, Jesus is going to be tested. It says in chapter 4, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. A couple things to address. The wilderness, it's a place of testing. Matthew is telling Jesus' story to show how Jesus' story parallels the story of the people of Israel. So remember, Israel came up out of Egypt, went through the waters of the Red Sea, out into the wilderness to meet with God, and there they were tested and found sorely wanting. Jesus was rescued out of Egypt as a baby, went through the waters of the Jordan River, and goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil. All right, second thing to address, in case you didn't know, we believe in the devil, and the best way I can describe him is, is to use an analogy. We, I'm assuming, all believe in gravity, right? It's a force that affects our lives that's immaterial. We can't see it. We can't taste it. We can't touch it. But it affects our lives, and it's an impersonal force at work in the world. Well, the devil is immaterial. You can't see him, taste him, or touch him. But he's a personal force at work in the world that may affect our lives. And he's come to test Jesus. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. Like starving. Like on, on the edge of dying, really. I don't know how many more days you can go before your body gives out, but he doesn't have long. And at that point, the tempter came to him and says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the tempter gives him a statement, a challenge, and Jesus responds with scripture. We're going to see this play out three times here in our passage this morning. But I think to understand it, we should understand the fact that, and this is my thought here, I think every temptation we are prone to fall into shows that we have a false belief about who God is. And so I want to interpret this through that lens. If you are the son of God, Satan is calling Jesus' identity into question. Because at his baptism, God says, you are my son, whom I love with you, I am well pleased. And Satan says, if you are God's son, well, tell these stones to become bread. Now, David, this is not a temptation for you or I, because we do not have the power to turn rocks into bread. Apparently, Jesus did. And he was starving. And what I think Satan is implying through this question is to say, hey, Jesus, if you're God's son, use your power and your authority to meet your own need. Jesus, apparently, God isn't looking out for you. He has left you to hunger and, and thirst and not provided for your needs. So why don't you take care of it yourself? And Jesus' answer by quoting scripture, one on the surface just says, we need more than physical sustenance to survive. But he's quoting, and he'll quote three times from the same passage in Deuteronomy. So we're going to go back and reference it. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now here's the story. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And Moses is talking to the Israelites about their experience with God from Egypt and into the wilderness. Remember how God rescued you from Egypt? He led you through the Jordan River and brought you, gave you water and food in the wilderness and brought you to the mountain and he met with you. And Moses is recounting that story. He says, here's the thing. Israel, you were called God's son back in Exodus chapter 4. God led you into the wilderness after rescuing you and saving you and telling you that he has good plans for you. He led you into the wilderness and then he did not meet your needs. He let you go hungry. 
He let you experience discomfort and want. And when you felt a need, then God brought you manna from heaven. God let you experience a desire, and then he met it later in order that you might learn that man shall not live on bread alone, but on everything that comes from God's mouth. You need more than just food. You need this relationship with God and the understanding that he is looking out for you and he's going to take care of you. You need him in your life. It's more than just food. And by saying this, Jesus is making this radical commitment. He's telling Satan, look, I actually, here's what I think he's saying. I believe that God has led me into the wilderness because it says he was led by the Spirit. And even though I'm currently starving after 40 days and 40 nights, and even though I might die, I believe that God is going to take care of me. And so I don't need to meet my own need. Later in, in Exodus 8, 5, Moses is telling the Israelites, God is disciplining you like a father disciplines his son. And I think Jesus is leaning into that. He says, I believe that my father will look out for me. And even if it kills me, even if, I mean, if I'm wrong, he's going to die. He's in the wilderness. There's no food. And uh, I don't imagine he has enough strength to get back to civilization. Whether or not I'm right about that, I'm not sure. But I think Jesus is betting his life that God will keep his promises, that God is good, and that God will take care of him. And Jesus passes the test. Then the devil took him to a holy city, sorry, to the holy city, to Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. All right, the devil knows scripture, and that is terrifying. Satan takes Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem, to the place where heaven and earth are supposed to overlap. And there, the devil quotes a convenient piece of scripture. Psalm 91, to the person who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, think like temple, and he says, God will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Hey, Jesus, you know, God's not been taking care of your needs right now, but you're going to trust him? Well, why don't you just make him take care of your needs right now. Because he promised that if you fall, his angels are going to bear you up and you won't strike your foot against a stone. You can leverage God's own promises against him right now. You can actually put, you can make God have to respond to your commands, much like my kids have learned how to do. You guys who are parents ever carried a bag of groceries and then your kid And all of a sudden, that little two-year-old realizes that you have no free hands to stop them from doing that thing they're not allowed to do. And so they start messing with your glasses or start like leaning out. And you're like, you're really heavy now, stop it. And, And it's like that, like, Jesus, you can put God under your influence. Just throw yourself down. Make God respond to you. Show, like, test him out. Prove it. And Jesus answers, oh, not that the scriptures are wrong, but the way that you want me to apply that is wrong. It's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And this is a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, I believe. And you could go back and read it. It just says just this. And Moses is referencing the story of what the Israelites did to God. So again, to tell you the story, remember God sent the plagues on Egypt. Like Yahweh wrecked the most powerful military force in the world at the time in order to bring these slaves out. He brought them to the edge of the Red Sea and said, hey, hang out here for a second. And all of a sudden, here comes the Egyptian army. And these people are looking around and they're going, we're dead. We don't stand a chance. There's no way out. God has brought us here to kill us. And God says, no, just watch. And then he opens up this way through the middle of the Red Sea and they go across on dry land. And when the Egyptians try to follow, God swamps them and destroys the Egyptian army. And they go out into the wilderness and they come to water that they can't drink because it's bitter. And then God makes it sweet. God's saying, I'm going to take care of you. And he leads them out further in the wilderness, and they have no food. And then God provides miraculous heaven bread for them. And then they go further out into the wilderness. So remember, like, all these things that God has done for them. And they come to a place where there's no water. And then they begin to grumble and complain. And they say, Moses, you must have taken us out here to kill us. God, your salvation is actually sadistic. You're you're trying to do us in. You don't love us. You don't care about us. And they're asking the question, is God even here at all. And Moses says, yeah, that wasn't okay. You're testing 
God. As if God needs to respond to your timetable because you don't trust that he's going to take care of you because you don't think he's good on his word. And Jesus, quoting Moses, says, hey, this is written. Don't test the Lord your God. He has done enough to show you that he's good and that he's powerful and he's going to take care of you. I don't, I don't need to put that to the test right now. And Jesus passes the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. So there's this elevation in Matthew from the wilderness to the temple, now to the high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And whether these are like physical, like Jesus was teleported by Satan, or whether this is all in a vision, I don't know. But he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All right, all, all the economies, all the populations, all the worship, the power, the fame that can come from all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil says, all this I will give you, he says, if you will bow down and worship me. I had a friend, a mentor named Jared Roth Wilson, who once said, temptation doesn't show us how low we're willing to go, but rather at what height, short of oneness with God, we're willing to settle. And the devil just offered Jesus the world. I will give you everything you can possibly imagine. All you have to do is worship me. It's the same question that we have anytime we go out into the world. We come around people and we ask, like, what are you living for? What really matters? What is the way to the good life? And people have their answers. You know, I, I look to my job, you know, other nations. I look to literally a foreign God to protect us, to bring us um, salvation, to bring us prosperity and happiness and, and peace, whatever it is. And the devil says to Jesus, I'll give you it all. You just worship me. And Jesus said to him, get away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I, I will go back and read Deuteronomy at this point because I think it's funny. So in Deuteronomy, the word, it's not worship, it's fear, has very similar connotations. Treat God as, as number one. <laughs> And the one that you have to deal with first and foremost, who's more scary than anything else. So yeah, we're going to respect this guy. And Moses says, fear Yahweh your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you, for Yahweh your God who is among you is a jealous God. And his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. I get the idea Jesus knew the scriptures well enough to say, yeah, it ain't worth it, Satan. You can't, you can't protect me. And at the end of the day, Jesus says, no, Satan, I'm going to wait. Because when the Father spoke from heaven and said, you are my son, whom I love, and you I'm well pleased, he's making a reference to Psalm 2, which is about the messianic king. It's about the fact that Jesus is destined by God to become king over all the nations of the entire earth. In fact, the devil is not ask, offering Jesus anything less than what God wanted to give him. The only difference is the devil is offering him a chance at it now. You know, at the wrong time and the wrong means for the wrong motive. And Jesus' response says that he's trusting in God and going to await his timing, even if it kills him. Get away from me, Satan. I will worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And lo and behold, the man who resisted the temptation to use his authority to turn rocks into bread gives his authoritative command to Satan, and the devil leaves. And angels came and attended him. God showed up and took care of his son. It wasn't before the test, and it wasn't during the test. It was afterwards, and Jesus passed. Much like God did to Abraham in Genesis 22, putting his righteous one under a test, and when Abraham passed the test, the angel intervenes. So God's angels came and attended to Jesus. And now at this point, Jesus has done something that no man or woman, and certainly not Lancelot, has ever done in the world. He actually resisted the devil. He kept faith in God even if it would kill him. And now we get to watch in anticipation through the rest of Matthew of what the person through whom God is bringing about his blessings in the world is going to be like, and it's going to be exciting. At the end of his life, Jesus, again, will face very similar temptations to these that he experienced alone in the wilderness. He will have an opportunity to call on the angels of God to come and rescue him. He will be challenged. If you are the son of God, save yourself as he's hanging, dying on the cross. Jesus could do it. He says, I could call and the angels would come and rescue me. And instead, he chooses to trust God even to the point of death. And he dies. In hope and confident assurance that on the third day, God will raise him from the dead. And that's exactly what happened. 
And so for us, family, this morning, in, in our passage, I, it's just really easy. I want us to trust in the word of God, to trust first and foremost in Jesus, because he did what none of us could do. And so let's get behind that guy, because <laughs> on our own, the rest of us don't stand a chance. We fail. To err is human. Or as someone else said, everybody has a price. All right? At what price can we be bought? And sometimes it, it's a little thing. I made a promise to my wife long ago that I would clean her bathrooms three times a week for the rest of our lives. Can you hear her laughing? <laughs> um, I have failed. I failed often and frequently and very early on. And since I just said, Kara, I need you to release me from this promise because there's no way this is going to happen. And, and why? Well, because at the time I made this promise, I, I could imagine no foreseeable future where this would not be something I would be easily be available and willing to do. And then life happened. And isn't that the way for us as humans? Life, life happens. And sometimes it, it's good and silly. And sometimes it's actually brutally hard. And, and I, I don't think it's a stretch to say most of you, if not every single person in this life, knows someone whose life has been utterly wrecked by the fact that someone who made a promise, when the going got tough, they got going. And they walked away from it. And broken promises have destroyed families. They have destroyed nations. And it hurts that, that none of us are good enough to resist temptation. Why? Because life happens and we're not strong enough to stand against it. And so praise God that Jesus came and he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And he lived the righteous life that we ought to have lived. And he died the death we deserve to die in order to give us a life that we never deserved in the world. And so we're going to put our faith in Jesus. Why? Because he's done it. He's done it. And this morning, I want to look at, at how Jesus responded to temptation. He responded three times with, it is written. He knew the words of God. He knew the promises of God. And he believed the scriptures. And he believed that God would make good on his promises, even if it killed him, because life was on the other side. And so for us, family of grace, I, I just want to call us to truly believe God's word and his promises. And I know, I know that many of you guys do. So first, let me just start with commending. To those of you who are giving your time and your energy and your money into loving and investing people who have nothing to give back to you, thank you for doing it. Because according to God's word, God sees it and God loves it and God will reward it. Your work is not in vain. To those of you who have opened up your, your family to welcome kids who aren't part of your family, and are nothing but a major drain on your time, your energy, your money, and your mental well-being, because you love Jesus, you're loving them, I would commend you. Why? Because God's word says God loves it, he sees it, and he rewards it. And to those of you who are tempted to say, maybe we can just make it our own way. Let, let's follow our own you know, career path. It's a very common thing that people are all about in America. We'll sacrifice for the career. We'll move away from family and friends. You know, even... Even our fellow Christians will go away to a new town to take a new job and they won't ever join with the faith community. And, and at a certain point, making money and providing financial security for ourselves and having a bigger house and a nicer car and just some better toys. And, and honestly, many of us would say, like, it seems like a pretty good life. Apart from God, it shows that they don't really believe that God's promises are true. And at that in the end, all those things that you're presently enjoying will, will be regretted in the end but a life of sacrificial service to love and bless the people that God has put around us right now is actually where the real reward will be. Will we believe it? And so as we are encountering this month of, of fasting and prayer, I just want to welcome you guys to, to pray with me about what God might want to do through our community, in our community, and then in our community. And if he shows us something, <laughs> let's get behind it. Trusting that he is good and he will keep his promises. Why? Because Jesus showed us. God can be counted on. Take it to the bank. Put all your eggs in this one basket. God is faithful and he'll keep his promises. And don't ever let anyone, Satan or others, tempt you to think that God won't actually show up and come through. Would you guys pray with me? <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your goodness. God, thank you for, for loving us. Father, I, I thank you for the, the testimony, not only of Jesus, who apparently told his disciples this story, or of the apostles, or of the early church, or, or of generations of Christians time and time again that have said resoundingly that, that you are good and faithful and that you will keep your promises. 
And Father, we will die, we will live, and we will die in hope that one day you will raise us to life in your presence, and one day everything that we have sacrificed will be rewarded, not only a hundredfold in this life, but in the age to come, uh, eternal life in your presence forever. God, would you help us to trust? God, help us to believe your word. Help us to put faith in Jesus and thank you for him. Thank you for the spirit that he has poured out upon his people, that you have given us your power to actually resist temptation and, and to turn away and to begin to live a holy life. And, and thank you that you are the God that promises to bring to completion what you have started and, and that you know that we're not perfect and you're committed to us anyway. Um, so Lord, may we bear with one another. May we uh, desire and, and move towards faithfulness more and more in our life now uh, as we await the life that you're going to bring us.